Hey everybody, welcome to the Manda Lake. I'm John as always, and it's time for the miscellaneous part one set review. We're done with white, blue, black, red, green. Now we're going to go on to multicolored and the first half of the artifacts. Tomorrow will be the second half of the artifacts and the lands. But we're going to jump right on in to the first multicolored card. Up first is Cloud Blazer. Cloud Blazer is three white blue for a creature human scout at Uncommon. She's a 2 2. She has flying, and when Cloud Blazer enters the battlefield, you gain two life and draw two cards. We all like Mull Drifter. Mull Drifter is four and a blue for basically this card, except you don't gain two life, and there's a weird thing called Evoke where you can cast it as an instant without getting the creature. Um, but yeah, this is Mull Drifter with to life attached to it basically uh yeah this just looks absolutely amazing uh using something like acrobatic maneuver on this would be huge uh we of course saw panharmonicon go crazy with it at the pre pre-release don't ever plan on doing that if you pull it off cool but that's not really the case that you should be expecting to have happen i think due to the two color nature of this it probably really isn't first pickable but still probably a highish pick. And of course, going into pack two or three, if you're in blue, white, or, or solidly in one and thinking about another, you're going to snap it up. I'm pretty happy giving this a B plus. I don't think I would ever first pick it, though. I, I know everybody loves it, but I don't think it's realistic to first pick it. Uh, multicolored cards and all that jazz, so B plus. Up next is Contraband Kingpin. Contraband Kingpin is blue and black for a creature Aetherborn Rogue at Uncommon. It's a 1-4, it has lifelink, and whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. This seems fine enough if you're in blue-black and not really a good enough reason for me to go into blue-black. Uh, if I'm solidly in one thinking about the other, it would be something that I would say, hey, that's here, I, I could go that way, but it's not going to super draw me in. It blocks really well and stalls the game out like crazy, which is what Blue Black typically wants to do, and it lets you scry a little bit if you do drop some artifacts. Now, don't get thinking about, oh, Fabricate, I'm going to have a billion servos. Blue doesn't have any Fabricate. So don't get too crazy about that. Remember, Fabricate is purely in white, green, and black. So this is fine. I'm pretty sure I'd play it every single time I have it uh, that I was in blue-black. I'm not going to go massively out of my way for it. It's nowhere near a, uh, a Cloud Blazer, for example. So I think I'm going to go with kind of a... I want to say B minus, maybe a C plus. No, let's go with B minus. It's really good if you're in blue black. I just don't think it draws you to blue black way near as much as something like Cloud Blazer does. So let's go with a B minus. Up next is Depala Pilot Exemplar. Depala Pilot Exemplar is one red white for a legendary creature dwarf pilot at rare. She's a 3 3. She says other dwarves you control get plus one plus one. Each vehicle you control gets plus one plus one, as long as it's a creature, so as long as you've crewed it. Uh, basically, whenever it's going to matter. Uh, whenever Depala Pilot Exemplar becomes tapped, you may pay X generic mana. If you do, reveal the top X cards of your library. Put all dwarf and vehicle cards from among them into your hand. Then put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Depala seems very solid. A uh, 3-3 three, three for 3 that gives your other doors plus 1 plus 1 and all your vehicles plus 1 plus 1. You know, if vehicles are solidly playable, then this helps enable that deck to really huge heights. However, even in the quote-unquote vehicle deck, I just don't feel like you're going to want more than like 3 vehicles. And in an average deck, you're going to want like 2 not too many more. Um, getting the card advantage anytime Depala attacks or crews a vehicle is going to be huge as well. Seems like an alright first pick and build around, but not quite bomb status. And if the deck doesn't actually work, it's going to fall lower. But let's start her at an A-. minus. Up next is Planeswalker number 3, Dovin Bond. Dovin Bond is 2 white blue for Planeswalker Dovin at Mythic. He's a 3 loyalty Planeswalker, so he sort of fails the vanilla Planeswalker test a little bit. His plus 1 is until your next turn. Up to 1 target creature gets minus 3, minus 0, and its activated abilities can't be activated. His minus 1 is you gain 2 life and draw a card. His minus 7 is you get an emblem with... Your opponents can't untap more than two permanents during their untap step, so creatures and or their land, so it's more than just a winter orb there. 
Compared to Chandra and Nissa, though, Dovin seems weaker in Limited than he does compared to those two. Constructed, sure, he seems a fair bit better, but I don't know about him in Limited being a powerhouse. I think he'll shine way better in Seal, or uh, not Sealed, Standard. Uh, he's still fine. He's still a first pick because, come on, Planeswalker, but his plus one is fine for protecting himself, very similar to Liliana's, except it can't actually kill things like Liliana's can. Uh, his minus one is also fine. Drawing a card is great. Two life tacked on. Why not? His ultimate is going to take you a minimum of four turns in order to pull off, and that's a little while, and if you do manage to somehow get there, you should be winning the game, which is what basically every Planeswalker's ultimate has ever been. Um, but yeah, he's just, he's he's much weaker than those other Planeswalkers, uh, at least in limited. So I'm only going to give him a B plus. Obviously, you'll first pick it because, hey, Planeswalker, probably going to be worth at least a little bit of money. Um, at a uh, casual event, anyways, you would probably snap first pick it. Plus, it has the usual Planeswalker tax of your opponent's going to freak out and they're going to make some poor attacks and Dovin's going to save you a whole bunch of life. So there is always that, of course. But I'm only going to give Dovin a B plus. I don't think he's anywhere near uh, Chandra or Nyssa. Next up is Imperial Voyager. Imperial Voyager is one green blue for a creature Vidalcan Scout at Uncommon. It's a 2-3. Flying, trample, whenever Imperial Voyager deals combat damage to a player, you get that many energy. So you don't just get one. If it does two, you get two energy for it. Like Long Tusk Cub, this seems like a great way of generating energy over and over and over. The upside is that this is a flyer, so you're a little bit more likely to hit your opponent. The downside is that it's a two-colored card. You're playing this in blue-green. Probably not anywhere else. You could splash for it, but I don't think you'd want to hurt your consistency, especially if you were already in green and you already had a cub. Anyways, as with most multicolored cards, we'll assume that you're in these colors, in which case this will do some solid work for you. I wouldn't bother dreaming about how much energy you'll get if you beef this up, because if you beef this up, you probably just win anyways, don't you, with a giant flying trampler? Anyways, not a first pick or a solid reason for me to dive into blue-green, but if I am le leaning towards there or solidly in one color and kind of lost as to where else to go, I'd give it a, a pretty good shot. All in all, I think it's a solid B. Up next is Engineered Might. Engineered Might is three green-white for a sorcery at Uncommon. Choose one. Target creature gets plus five, plus five, and gains trample until end of turn. Or, creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and gain vigilance until end of turn. This seems really not great. It seems really mediocre. Five mana for a crummy overrun, so instead of plus three, plus three, and, three and trample, we get plus two, plus two, and vigilance. Uh, or five mana for an almost identical larger than life, which we talked about yesterday. One, or sorry, one and a green for plus four, plus four and trample at sorcery speed. Tack on a whole bunch of extra mana plus a different color, and we get plus one, plus one more power. This just seems frankly awful. It'll win a game here and there, sure, but it's just so costly. It's multicolored. It's just not what I want to be doing, especially not at sorcery speed. I'm out on this. Like, I don't think this should make your deck very often at all. And unlike basically every other gold on common in this, uh, uh, in this set, except for the next one that we'll talk about. Um, it's bad. The rest are great. This one just, no. Like, I I'm on a D plus on this. I just don't think you should ever really be looking to play this. It's so expensive in sorcery speed. Just bleh. C uh, D plus. Up next is Hazardous Conditions. Hazardous Conditions is two black green for a sorcery at Uncommon. Creatures with no counters on them get minus two, minus two until end of turn. Pardon? That, it's a really weird restriction. It's not even your creatures. It's just any creatures that have counters on them don't get minus two, minus two. I mean, I guess black, green are two of the fabricate colors, and there is a heavy counters theme in green. Anyways, this is your minus two, minus two set effect of the set, and they're usually sideboard only. Maybe if you're really seriously in on counters, you could maybe main deck this, but I'm not a fan of doing so. I think I'll keep this at a D minus. If I end up being against a giant servo board, sure, it can come in out of the sideboard, but I will never main deck this. D plus, uh, D plus. Up next is Combo Console of Allocation. One white black for a legendary creature human advisor at rare. It's a two three. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, that player loses two life and you gain two life. Three mana for a 2-3 that'll get you a four life gain swing maybe two or three times a game? 
It's fine. It's not first pickable quality, but it's fine. Remember my usual prowess ca uh, caution that non-creature spells are a minority of cards in a limited deck, so this will be a 2-3 three for 3 a lot of the game. Seems much better for a constructed, but for limited, I'm going to set it a B- on this. I just don't think it's really that powerful to jump in on. Obviously, in constructed, you side this in against something like a control deck, and you just laugh all the way to the bank. Uh, but limited, eh. It's fine if you're in white-black, but I think this is like a, a high mid-pack two kind of pick, so B-. minus. Next up is Rashmi, Eternity's Crafter. Rashmi is a two green-blue legendary creature elf druid at Mythic. She's a 2-3. Whenever you cast your first spell each turn, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a non-land card with converted mana cost less than that spells, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. If you don't cast the revealed card, put it into your hand. Very, very yes. Two colors, don't care. I'm first picking this every single time I see it. It's two, three, four, four, which is not great. But that value, every single spell you cast at least cantrips. It at least draws you a card. Or potentially just flat out turns into a second spell. Uh, this just seems super, super, super solid. I want this. I want it bad. Uh, this is the card that I want to be opening on launch weekend in my very first draft. Rashmi, solid A. Solid, solid A. Restoration Gearsmith is up next. Two white black for a creature human artificer at Uncommon. She's a 3-3. When Restoration Gearsmith enters the battlefield, return target artifact or creature card from your graveyard to your hand. This is basically just Grave Digger, which is three and a black for a 3-3 to return a creature to hand. This, you know, is slightly harder to cast because it's white black, but you also get to uh, potentially return an artifact for the same cost. Seems awesome. Not a first pick by any means, but if you're in white or black, it's a card to pick and head towards Orzov. And if you're in white black, it should be a, a very high pick. Um, not over removal, of course, but still high, high, high pick, like top kind of four picks once you know you're in those colors. Solid B. I like Restoration Gearsmith quite a bit. Sahili Rai is our next and final Planeswalker of the set. One blue-red for a Planeswalker Sahili. She's a mythic with three loyalty, so she passes the loyalty vanilla test. Plus one, scry one. Sahili Rai deals one damage to each opponent. Minus two, create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact in addition to its other's types. That token gains haste, exiled at the beginning of the next end step. Search your, minus seven, search your library for up to three artifact cards with different names, put them onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. Sahili, very similar to Dovin, seems weaker than the two monocolored planeswalkers that we have, which is a shame. Her plus one is totally fine, you know, scrying one and then pinging each opponent, or in most cases, one opponent, is totally fine. It's not card advantage, so you don't to draw the card, which kind of sucks, to be honest. That's surprising for a blue walker to not draw. Her minus two doesn't protect herself. You can make a copy of an artifact or creature that goes away at the beginning of your next end step. So you need to be attacking with it. She does not protect herself. Her minus seven, you better have awesome artifacts in your deck or else you're just not going to get there. So Healy just seems weak, honestly. Honestly, a little bit weaker than even Dovin Bon. Um, I bet there's stuff you could do with her in Constructed. You could have, you know, a ton of awesome mythic artifacts in your Constructed deck. Limited, though, Sahili seems kind of not great. You'd probably first pick her just for value reasons at an FNM, but beyond an FNM, I don't think you should be first picking her. I don't think you should be picking her basically at all until mid to like late mid pack and uh, when you're in blue red she doesn't seem great i'm gonna give her a b minus because she's a planeswalker you'll pick her she has the planeswalker thing of messing up your opponent's thoughts and forcing them to weird attacks but she's just really weak for limited even weaker than dovin b minus not a fan strange grade for a not a fan card but she is still planeswalker so you know that whole shebang b minus for sahili rai up next is Unlicensed Disintegration. Unlicensed Disintegration is really hard to say. One black red for an instant at uncommon. Destroy target creature. If you control an artifact, Unlicensed Disintegration deals three damage to that creature's controller. Ah, uh, yeah, this is just flat out 
kill something. This just seems like really, really, really solid unconditional removal at three mana. It's murder, basically, except it's in two colors, which makes it worse for sure. Uh, really kind of restricts the ability to make this a first pick, I think, but still, it'll be a high pick nonetheless and a reason to go into Rakdos. Uh, if you have an artifact getting to bolt your opponent as well, just seems really good. I'm going to give it a B plus. I don't think you can in good conscience first pick it, but B plus. Up next is Veteran Motorist. Veteran Motorist is red-white for a creature dwarf piloted on common. It's a 3-1. When Veteran Motorist enters the battlefield, scry 2. Whenever Veteran Motorist crews a vehicle, that vehicle gets plus 1, plus 1 until end of turn. I'm not blown away by this guy. It's a 3-1 for 2, which I like, but it's two different colors. Think of the multitude of times that you don't have perfect mana on turn 2. Congrats, this guy does nothing. And then you end up with a turn 3, turn 4, turn 5, or later 3-1. Big whoop. It scries 2, which is nice enough and kind of helps out there a little bit. But yeah, if this guy doesn't come down on turn 2, I feel like you are really kind of behind. The crewing thing's cool, but I really think that it's rarely correct to have more than a couple vehicles in your deck, so I don't think you'll be picking this guy and saying, all right, all in on vehicles. So I think it's more just a cool bonus than anything else. Ultimately, this just seems a little bit too much kind of needing to go right for it to be awesome it's still really solid and if i'm in red white i'll pick him up when i see him but i think i have to be in red white to pick this not just thinking about it i'm just not in on a red white creature that i basically really want to have on turn two in order for it to be great so i'm on a b minus it's still a great card but some stuff has to go right so b minus for veteran motorist up next is Voltaic Brawler. Voltaic Brawler is red-green for a creature human warrior at Uncommon. It's a 3-2. When Voltaic Brawler enters the battlefield, you get two energy. Whenever Voltaic Brawler attacks, you may pay energy. If you do, it gets plus one, plus one, and gains trample until end of turn. 3-2 uh, for two. Again, you know, that's, that's actually really good, and that's really aggressive. Plus, getting two energy and being able to make this into a 4-3 when it attacks... The uncommons in this set seem really, really good, but like Veteran Motorist, being two colors, it's not always going to come down on turn two. However, unlike Veteran Motorist, I think that this is okay coming down on turn three and turn four because it's still kind of uncurved power level wise because this is way above curve for two mana. That being said, never really a first pick, I don't think, but a high mid pack pick and an auto include if you're in red green. I like Voltaic Brawler quite a bit. Solid B. Our final gold card for the set is Whirler Virtuoso. Whirler Virtu Virtuoso is a one blue red creature of a Dalkin Artificer at Uncommon. It's 2 3. When Whirler Virtuoso enters the battlefield, you get three energy. Pay three energy. Create a 1 1 colorless Thopter artifact token with flying. Creature token, of course. Three mana for two threes, fine filler. Not good filler, but fine filler. Getting three energy is pretty nice tacked onto it, and being able to instantly turn that into a flyer is great, making this virtually a three four for three. Making it basically a gear a poor uh, gear crafter or a sand step outcast. I'm sold right there. If you can churn out additional flyers with this thing, it'll be just fantastic. And even if people remove your virtuoso, you still have your flyers left. I don't think this is a strong first pick due to the dual color nature, as I've said all along, but it's a snap pick when you're leaning towards is it and an auto include. I really like Whirler Virtuoso. I think it's a fantastic payoff for energy. Solid B. Like it quite a bit. That's going to wrap it up for the gold cards. We're going to move on to the start of the artifacts, and we're going to do the first 20. The other uh, 26 will be tomorrow, along with the lands, which, of course, most of them will be clumped together in one. But up first, we have Accomplished Automaton. Accomplished Automaton is a seven generic mana artifact creature construct. It's a common, it's a 5-7, and it has Fabricate 1. We've talked about the various sorry your draft went poorly, but here's a win condition I guess cards, and this is the artifact version. Seven mana for a basically featureless five seven or, or six eight is just not where you wanna be. Avoid this unless you are truly, truly desperate. Solid D, this should not be in your main deck. If it did, good luck with your draft, something went wrong. 
Up next is Aether Flux Reservoir. Aether Flux Reservoir is four generic mana for an artifact at rare. Whenever you cast a spell, you gain one life for each spell you've cast this turn. So the first one gets you one life, the second one gets you two life, the third one gets you three life. Pay 50 life. Aether Flux Reservoir deals 50 damage to target creature or player. Yeah, you heard that right. Pay 50, deal 50. Uh, I'm going to crush some dreams here. You are not pulling this off in limited. Maybe once out of every 100 matches that you try, but that's a pretty bad win percentage. I'm not interested in a 1% win rate. Uh, this should not be a card that you even remotely consider playing. Commander, Highlander, Casual, Cube, sure, go nuts. Kaladesh Draft, Kaladesh Sealed, do not touch it. It is a solid F. Up next is Aetherworks Marvel. Aetherworks Marvel is four generic mana for a legendary artifact at Mythic. Whenever a permanent you control is put into a graveyard, you get one energy. Tap, pay, six energy. Look at the top six cards of your library. You may cast a card from among them without paying its mana cost. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Uh, this seems really fun. It seems really fun. It might be too cute. I don't want it to be, though I want this to be fun and actually okay. Permanents will go to the graveyard, though hopefully not too many because it is counting your permanents. Getting to six energy once shouldn't be too hard if you build around it. And getting there twice shouldn't be too, too hard to do if you really build around it. After that, though, and I think you're in magical Christmas land. That being said, you could whiff on this really hard. You could pay six energy and, I don't know, reveal six lands off the top of your library or something like that and that would be bad we'll have to see what the energy to mana exchange rate really is like once we actually get into the format to see if this is possible if it's like two energy equals one mana which it seems to be and they've sort of mentioned that then all you need to do to get your value is hit a three drop right pay six energy the equivalent of three mana hit a three drop you made your energy money back uh i don't know we'll have to see how this shakes out i'm gonna start overly optimistic i think at a b minus there's every likelihood that this just whiffs too much or it just doesn't hit what it needs to hit or energy is not as hard or not that easy to come by if you dedicate yourself to it we all know that i'm not energy's biggest proponent but yeah we'll see how this one goes optimistic b minus up next is Animation Module. Animation Module is one generic mana for an artifact at rare. Whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are placed on a permanent you control, you may pay one generic mana. If you do, create a 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact creature token. Pay three generic mana and tap. Choose a counter on target permanent or player. Give that permanent or player another counter of that kind. This seems fine to me, and I do like how low the investment is, just a single mana. Uh, and if you have any sort of counters theme going on, or fabricate theme, you're going to just start churning out servos. Then for three mana, you can proliferate one counter a turn. Probably a plus one plus one counter, but you could also buy some energy or, or whatever counter you want. I imagine you could probably reasonably first pick this with the intent to build around kind of the Fabricate Counters Matter uh, deck, sort of green, white, or possibly green, black. I don't think it's bomby enough to justify the first pick rating, though. I don't know. I'll start this at a C plus. I could see it going lower and higher, I think, is just not reliable enough. That being said, we're going to take a look at a couple of other modules a little bit later on. And if you get all three of them, you actually build an engine where you pay a mana to make a servo and get a counter and get an energy over and over and over and over and over. Uh, kind of cool, but moving on to the next card. Endara Express. Andara Express is a five generic mana artifact vehicle. They're here. We're finally going to talk about them at common. It's an eight, six. It has menace and it has crew four. So this is the first vehicle that we're going to talk about despite talking about them all week long. Crew means tap any number of creatures you control with total power X or more. This vehicle becomes an artifact creature until end of turn. So when you play this, it has power and toughness printed on it, but it doesn't actually have it because it's not a creature. And the border kind of helps remind you of that. Only once you tap, in this case, four power worth of creatures, does this actually become a creature. So, there's some things to know about vehicles. Crewing, first off, should be done in your main phase. At the latest, it has to be done at the beginning of combat step. You cannot go to attackers and then crew. You cannot do that. So make sure that you do crew your vehicles in the main phase or at the latest, 
the beginning of combat step. Just a few other quick generic things about artifacts. I'm really of a mindset that you should never really play more than three. Two is preferable, and even one might be what you want to do. You should really look at these as equipment. They do nothing. Absolutely nothing if you don't have creatures to crew them. They are a waste of mana and a waste of a card. Keep that in mind when you're thinking about the vehicles. So, Andara Express, 8-6 Menace. That's amazing, especially for 5 mana. But the crew, 4. That is hard. That is really hard. Maybe you have a 4x and you can tap it and turn it into an 8-6, and that's amazing. But... It just takes one little tiny piece of removal or even bounce from your opponent to turn this into a giant hunk of rusting steel. Ugh, I'm really hesitant about vehicles that have high crew. Basically higher than three and preferably higher than two is kind of where I want to have the cutoff. And Dara Express just is going to be a big hunk of garbage way too amount of the time. I'm out on it. D+. Plus. Yeah, I'll lose to it here or there, but I don't think you should really be playing it. It's just way too expensive of a crew, of a crew cost, so D+. Plus. Up next is another vehicle, Ballista Charger. Ballista Charger is also 5 generic mana for an artifact vehicle at Uncommon. It's a 6-6, six, six, so it's slightly smaller. It doesn't have a menace. However, when Ballista Charger attacks, it deals 1 damage to target creature or player. So you turn it sideways, kill their servo, and haha, a blocker is already out of the way. Its crew is 3. Three is a world of difference from four. There's a lot of three X's in the format. There's way fewer four X's. So I don't think Ballista Charter is going to be a hunk of useless garbage all that often. It definitely can be, and that's just going to be a thing for all vehicles in general. But this one, I think, is just going to be really, really, really solid. Um, you know, it's a 6-6, six, six, so it's already going to be a little bit harder to block. Plus, the ping means that it's virtually a 7-6, or you can get rid of those annoying servo chump blockers and things like that. I'm not sure that this would be exactly a high pick, but I'm pretty sure I would play it 100% of the time that I have it. So I am going to put it at a C+. I like Ballista Charger. It seems pretty solid as far as vehicles go. Bastion Mastodon is up next. Bastion Mastodon is a five generic mana. That seems to be a magic number. Uh, artifact creature elephant at common. It's a four five. Pay a white mana. Bastion Mastodon gains vigilance until end of turn. Meh, this is a big, boring, dumb creature. It's a 4-5 for 5, which is fine, but totally filler, and that's sorry about your to weak top end kind of type of card. The white to give vigilance is literally a non-entity. It just doesn't matter. It's a cool bonus, but it doesn't change your rating in any way, shape, or form. This is a D+. Plus. Just try not to end up with this in your deck. If you have to, you have to, but try not to. It's just really big and dumb, so D+. Plus. Bomat Bazaar Barge is going to break the uh, five generic mana combo with four generic mana for an artifact vehicle at Uncommon. It's a 5-5, five five, and when Bomat Bazaar Barge enters the battlefield, draw a card. And Crew 3. Now this is one of the really nice vehicles because it's not just a useless hunk of steel. It does something when it comes into the battlefield, it draws you a card, which is awesome. It's also only four generic mana, which is way lower of a, a mana cost than what we've seen so far. And crew three is totally fine. You should be able to crew three a non-zero amount of the time, and that three power gets to turn into five power. I think this is just a really, really, really solid vehicle. I, I, I think it's probably even slightly better than the Ballista Charger. Uh, I'm all in on a B- minus on this. I, I think this is one of these sort of breakout vehicles of the format. Um, leave your trains at home, you know, keep your chargers parked, ready to go if you need them, but you should be uh, driving your Beaumont Bazaar barges all the time. B-. minus. Up next is Beaumont Courier. Beaumont Courier is one generic mana for an artifact creature construct at rare. It's a 1-1 one, one with haste. Whenever Beaumont Courier attacks, exile the top card of your library face down. That means you can't look at it. Nobody can look at it. Pay one red mana. Discard your hand. Sacrifice Beaumont Courier. Put all cards exiled with Beaumont Courier into their owner's hands, which really should be yours, but you know. This just feels way too weak and way too much work to get any payout off of this. Gets in for one on turn one. Cool. 
I guess. But eh, the odds of this living long enough that you don't have to discard many cards and actually draw a bunch is just very unlikely. Plus, you're going to get in with this, what, once? Maybe twice? Just way too much work. I, I think this is unplayable. And this will be one of those rares that just make me question how truly bad my luck is when I open my first pack. Uh, this is kind of like the corrupted graph stone of the set. But at least this can attack on like a corrupted graph stone. Uh, I'll give it an F plus because of that fact that it is better than a corrupted graph stone. So F plus for Bomat Courier. Up next is Chief of the Foundry. Chief of the Foundry is an artifact creature construct. It's three generic mana for an uncommon, and it's a 2-3. Other artifact creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Look who's back from Origins. In Origins, this was a little bit hard to pull off, but it still could do disgusting things with Thopters. But in Kaladesh, that's an entirely different story. Artifact creatures are everywhere if you want them and with servos and thopters this could be very strong especially paired with the other thopter servo lord as if we needed two lords for one uh creature type in this format uh yeah this just seems really 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 good i, I would be inclined to first pick this and go deep on it uh i'm happy to give this a b plus i think it's going to be really 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 solid in many decks maybe even most decks, and the decks that it goes bonkers in are not going to be that hard to pull off either. So B plus for Chief of the Foundry. Cogworker's Puzzle Knot is up next. It's two generic mana for an artifact at common, and it's part of a Puzzle Knot cycle. All of these have an effect when they come to the battlefield, and then you can pay and sack them to do the effect again. So Cogworker's Puzzle Knot enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 colorless servo artifact creature token. Pay one and a white sacrifice Cogworker's Puzzle Knot, create a 1-1 colorless servo artifact creature token. I just don't get it. It's a two mana 1-1 and then a four mana 2-2. Two -two. I guess this is like a cheap artifact to help with your artifact count, plus the servo counts it as a second artifact, and then you don't need it anymore. You can turn it into a chump blocker. I don't know. I feel like there's got to be better ways to get your artifact count up. I feel like there's got to be better things to do shrewd negotiation with. I'm pretty out on this. I'm, I'm going to go with a C- minus on it. This is probably the best of the puzzle knots, um, and that's saying something. So C- minus for Cogworkers Puzzle Knot. Up next is Consulate Skygate. Consulate Skygate is two generic mana for an artifact creature wall at common. It's an 0-4 with Defender and Reach, and that's about it. If you are not the beatdown, you could side this in against somewhat aggressive decks and or flyers, but I'm not sure that I would ever main deck this in anything but the absolute most controlliest of decks. Uh, yeah, don't touch this. It's just not going to do anything for you. D+. Plus. Up next is our first rare vehicle, Cultivator's Caravan. Cultivator's Caravan is three generic mana for an artifact vehicle at rare. It's a 5-5. You can tap it to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Note, you can do this at any time. It doesn't have to be a creature. And its crew is three. I really liked Bomat Bazaar Barge. I like Cultivator's Caravan even more. This is awesome. This really does something. At its bare minimum, it's a three mana mana rock totally sold on that then if you can spot an opening and have a creature you can ram on in for five i'm sold i like this a lot i would consider it a relatively high pick probably first pick not quite bomby so i'm not going to go any higher than a b plus on it but a b plus is where i am going to sit up next is Deadlock Trap. Deadlock Trap is three generic mana for an artifact at rare. Deadlock Trap enters the battlefield tapped. When Deadlock Trap enters the battlefield, you get two energy. Tap, pay one energy. Tap target creature or planeswalker. Why would you tap a planeswalker? Well, that's not the part that matters. It's activated abilities can't be activated this turn. That's what matters for planeswalkers. Now, of course, the planeswalker part is purely flavor text. It's just not something you should ever think about in Limited. Uh, this is pay an energy, tap a creature, and at its base, you get two activations. It's not enough for me. Like the Janjeet Sentry, you need to have solid energy production slash other energy for this to even begin to become okay. And even then, I just feel like there's way better things to be doing with your energy and your mana and your card slots than playing a deadlock trap. I'm pretty far out on it. I just think it's way too much work for way too little playoff. I'm going with a D plus on deadlock trap. 
Up next is Decoction Module. Decoction Module is two generic mana for an artifact at Uncommon. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you get one energy. Pay four generic mana, tap it, return target creature you control to its owner's hand. This is the second part of the module engine that you can build. If you're really pushing hard for energy, I think this seems okay. Two mana, and it should net you a solid three to five mana on average. The ability is pretty eh, though. It does a decent imitation of Hexproof if you leave up four mana, but that is asking a fair bit. You could also potentially get some value from Enter the Battlefield effects by paying four and bringing it back to your hand and recasting it, but that's also paying quite a bit. Uh, I think if you want this, you'll be able to get it, but I think only a few decks will really want this. One of them very namely being the Module Engine deck, if that even actually exists. So I'm kind of out on it. I'm going to start it at like a C minus. I don't think you should realistically take this. Up next is Demolition Stomper. Demolition Stomper is six generic mana for an artifact vehicle at Uncommon. It's a 10-7. Demolition Stomper can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. Crew, five. Not allowing this to be chump blocked by little things is nice, but Crew 5 is asking way, way, way too much for way little in return, plus costing 6 mana on top of that. Breaking the fourth wall a little and getting into design logic, I feel like this would be a rare card if it was actually good. The fact that it's an uncommon belies to me the idea that this is probably actually not very good, and I'm inclined to say that it's a skill testing card and that it's actually just bad. Costing that much mana, requiring that much to crew, just not much going on there. I think this is a card that new players are going to go, wow, 10 power, and then they're going to lose. And then someday they'll say, wait a minute, this card's actually bad. They'll have their level up moment, and they'll get to move on from that. As a result, I'm going to start way out on this card. I think it's just bad and relatively unplayable. Uh, I, I'm prepared to lose to it here and there, but I'm also prepared to sit and watch my opponent have it on board doing nothing. Uh, D, I think this card is just bad. Uh-uh, I'm out. Dukara Peafowl is up next. Dukara Peafowl is four generic mana for an artifact creature bird at common. It's a 2-4. You can pay a blue to give Dukara Peafowl flying until end of turn. Four mana 2-4 doesn't pass the vanilla test exactly, but it is a very common stat combination, often seen on knights. They don't usually have flying, and these stats are often a little bit more defensive. Uh, you know, this is fairly generic and plain and not Always having flying means that it's a poor version of a flying 2-4, which they do exist out there. I just can't remember the name of them offhand. Um, and having to keep back a mana to be defensive just doesn't sound like something I want to do. But if I am in blue, this does attack pretty decently. The 4 mana is still a little bit much, so I don't think this is any higher than a C at best. I think you can absolutely cut this if you just have better things, if you don't have a need for an artifact, etc. Uh, if you do, I, I think you're totally fine playing it, but I think it is one of those cards where it's just kind of take it or leave it. So C for Dukara Peafowl. Dynavolt Tower is up next. Dynavolt Tower is three generic mana for an artifact at rare. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you get two energy. Tap, pay, six energy, five energy, five energy. Dynavolt Tower deals three damage to target creature or player. This is a really cool flavor of a, a Tesla coil-like device sort of powering up as you cast spells and then discharging and shooting things. But I don't think the blue-red spells deck is going to exist anywhere near the same level that it did in Eldritch Moon. I think this is more intended to push that deck as a thing in Constructed, so I wouldn't really expect to be generating large amounts of energy off this alone. But with some help from other cards and being in a heavy energy deck, this is a great sink for those energy tokens. Being able to bolt and, you know, really bolt to the face or a creature will be a nice use for uh, any spare energy that you have laying around. Where do you pick this, though? I'm not really sure. I, I don't think it's first pickable. I think it's a little bit more kind of mid-packish pick. So I'm going to go with a B- minus on Dynavolt Tower. Love the flavor. Card, a little bit less so, but still seems fine. Up next is Eager Construct. Eager Construct is two generic mana for an artifact creature construct at common. It's a 2-2. When Eager Construct enters the battlefield, each player may scry one each player. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Uh, if you need a two drop, sure. But there's way better ones out there at common even. Giving your opponent a scry is a negative to this card. They get to draw their scryed card first. 
Frankly, the days of tutus for two with a downside are behind us. This should be cut most of the time. I really don't care for it. I'm at a C minus on it. I don't want to play this. I don't want to have to play this. I just don't like the idea of a, a symmetrical scry. So C minus for eager construct. Up next, artifact number 20. We're actually going to do 21 just so that we can finish the module cycle. But artifact number 20 is Electrostatic Pummeler. Electrostatic Pummeler is three generic mana for an artifact creature construct at rare. It's a 1-1 one, one for three. When it enters the battlefield, you do get three energy, and you can pay three energy to make Electrostatic Pummeler a 2-2. Two, two. It's not exactly what it says. Electric static, Electrostatic Pummeler gets plus X plus X until end of turn where X is its power. So, of course, without any outside influence, it becomes a 2-2 for 3 energy. Not great, but there's other things you could do with this, although they are a lot of work. And I think there's just too much work to be done here. The upside is that the ability doesn't cost mana, so you can use your mana to pump this up with larger than life or something, and then use the energy to double its power and toughness. That's really the cool design part of energy, is that it's a totally separate resource entirely. But still, this is a 1-1 one, one for 3 before any of that happens. It's an artifact, which means there's even more removal that can blow it up at instant speed. It just feel, feels way too glass cannony for me. I do not want to throw a larger than life on this and then throw three energy down and cast a spell to give me more energy and then do another three energy and then have my opponent say, haha, I bounce it. <laughs> I don't want to walk into that. Um, I, I'm not 100% out on this. I don't think it's a D or anything. I'm going give to give it a C minus. It's going to be another rare that I'm not really going to be happy to open, and I think you should pick this really late into the pack and give it a try maybe a little bit later into the format or at the pre-release. Those are kind of the two places to really fool around with the format. In the middle, you usually want to be more serious. So I'm going to go C- minus on Electrostatic Pummeler. I just think it's too, too much work and too glass cannon E. All right, our final card for the day and the final module of the module trilogy is the Fabrication Module. Fabrication Module is three generic mana for an artifact at Uncommon. Whenever you get one or more energy counters, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Pay four generic mana tap, you get an energy. So I'm not entirely sure where I land on any of these modules on their own, honestly. As you heard in the other two one, uh, there are three mana... They do nothing until other stuff happens, which is a tough call. I guess the rare one's a one mana one. Uh, obviously, I'd love to build the engine of the three of them. And I'll talk about that in a second, just in case you don't quite get it. Uh, this one, I think, is the weakest because it does require the most specific thing to happen. Getting an energy compared to playing a creature or getting a one one counter. I guess one one counters and energy are probably roughly equivalent in this set. We'll see. Uh, but I'll admit, I just don't know on this one. I'm going to start it at a C plus and be prepared to be really wrong in kind of either direction. Um, so yeah, the cool thing with these three modules is that if you have all of them out and any of them trigger, they will all trigger each other until animation module says, hey, do you want to pay a mana to make a servo? At which point you pay a mana to make a servo, which triggers decoction module because a creature enters the battlefield. So you get an energy, which triggers fabrication module. You got an energy, so you get to put a counter on something, which triggers animation module. You put a counter on something. Do you want to pay one to make a servo? And so then you can just pay one to get a servo, get an energy, and get a counter every single loop. And it's going to be awesome if somebody actually manages to build it. Um, I want to do it. I at least one time want to do it. I will force it if I have to one time. Probably no more than one time. I don't think it's going to be worth it exactly, but I think it'll be cool to do. But anyways, fabrication module by itself. I'm going to start it at a C plus, I think think maybe more like a C. Yeah, let's go with C on it. I, I'm not that optimistic about it. So C for fabrication module. All right, that's going to wrap it up for the first half of artifacts and the gold set review. As always, let me know what your favorite cards are from this uh, chunk of cards. And of course, you will certainly let me know what I was totally and utterly wrong about in the comments down below. As always, if you do have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at the Leak. That's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. You can find me at facebook.com slash TheManaLeak, twitch.tv slash TheManaLeak. And if you do want to support me and uh, help me continue to produce content, because of course, magic cards are not free, 
tea, you can go over to patreon.com slash the Manalik and become a backer there. One dollar, thousand dollars, it's all the same to me. I, I'd prefer a thousand dollars, but I'll take the one dollar as well. I greatly appreciate every single backer that I have and every future backer that I will have as well. So head on over there if you do want to do that. If you do like the content, please click that thumbs up icon. Please click subscribe. And if you do have any questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you all tomorrow for the final Artifacts and Land set review.